Okay, I need a favor. I need a favor. I would like Jay, please, to come up. And Jeff, please, come, come, come join me, please, up here. Please, please, please. Nobody's in trouble. It's not the principal's <laughs> office. Love you, love you, love you, love you. So while they're making their way up here, how many people got a chance to see our new website this week? Did you see it? It was nice, right? It was very, very nice. Awesome. Well, there's something on there that you may not have known, and you didn't, you didn't know that it was happening, but... Um, we have made a decision here at the church that uh, we've prayed, right? You pray and you expect God to answer. He wants to answer. He likes to, to pour out his blessing on his church. And, and he wants to see it grow. And, and he's going to equip this place and prepare it to do something great. And so we've been praying for a band, the band, to come, right? The band with, listen, not with the best voice right here. The heart, right? The heart of worship. And so we need, we need somebody who can, who can love those people and pastor those people um, to look after them and to make sure that they're not just objects and tools for us to use to bless you and help you have a better relationship with the Lord because that's what happens in a band often. And, and we don't want that to happen because the worship that happens up here is a result of the overflow of the worship that the band is having with the Lord in their own private life. And so we want to make sure that that is being nurtured and growing all the time so that they can better bless you. Okay, so, so all of us are called to the work of the ministry, right? Do you know that? Did you know that? No one's off the hook here, yo. Right? You're all appointed. But sometimes the Holy Spirit appoints someone for a special work. I gotta get down here. This is not good. So, 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 you know, recently we 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 appointed Jay as an elder here at the church. Anybody happy about that? I'm super happy about that. He's he's preaching next week too. Yeah. Yes. Amen. And I'm gonna be here, and I'm gonna learn and love it. It's gonna be great, and it's gonna be good. It's gonna be good. And then and then Pastor Ramon, he was up here when we did that. I'm happy about that too. Anyone happy about that? Right. Amen. Here, listen. I'm going to hammer you guys on rev groups tonight, so you better buckle down to your seat, okay? But this is Jeff Letourneau. I don't know if, if all of you know Jeff. Jeff and his wife, Colleen, have been coming now for a while. I've known Jeff longer than I've known my wife. I've known him for a long, long time, like since I became a Christian. I bumped into him in a coffee shop. Do you guys remember PJ's Coffee Shop in Houston? Remember that place? It's gone now. He was in there with his Bible, and it was falling apart, and he'd sit there, and he'd just share the scriptures with people. That's how I met this freak. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so several months ago, he, 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 he loud and clear, God says, I want you to go to Revolution. That's where I need you to serve. Yeah. And, and, yep, I'm super excited about that. And so, and I, and I love him, and I trust him, and he's, he's a Marine, so it's good to have him <laughs> around. And so he has my back like he loves me. And, and my wife and I love him, and not, like, we, you guys don't trust everybody, right? Don't be foolish. Don't trust everybody, right? We've all got burned. And, 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 and I've got burned a lot, but my wife has a good nose about that, and she loves this guy. She's like, this is a good guy right here. This is a good guy. And she feels that way about this guy, and she feels that, hey, Debbie's here. Hey, how's, how's it going? Hi, Debbie. And uh, you and Mimi are twins. Isn't that nice? Look at that. <laughs> Matching walkers. That's awesome. And so... <laughs> That's so cool. And, and, and uh, I don't even know what I'm saying, but I love you, Ramon. Yeah, and, and so, yeah, she loves him too. And, and so I just want to let you know that, that um, we're, we're still waiting for our worship leader to come in, but we have a worship pastor now, Amen. and it's this man. So I want to do what we, what we haven't done yet because this was all done outside of the service, but we're, you know, we, 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 we want to do things biblically. Hey, you have one of our old Bibles. That's so cool. You still have it. And so um, I love that. That's cool. And, and so we want to we do what we did before and with these guys, and we want to pray over him. So can we do that? Come on, Jay. And uh, why don't, can, I let, can I have you do that? Can, would you pray for this man? And what's, can you guys just all kind of just like point your hand up here towards this guy? Like, the, you know, like, here's your prayer. It's going this way, Lord, for this guy right here. Would you do that? Let's do that. Come on. Father God, as we come before your throne of grace, Lord, I've come to know Jeff. One of the things that 
always impresses me about people is when they are so humble. Yeah. And when it's all about you, Lord. Amen. It's not about what they can do. Lord, I believe He has a heart like that. Yes, He does. He has a heart of a humble servant. Lord, I don't know where you're going to take this worship team. <coughs> But it's going to be great height. Yes, yes. Lord, I know as I've talked to Jeff, Moses and I have talked, you brought him here. Yes. You brought him to this place just as surely as you brought me, just as surely as you brought Moses, yes. just as surely as you brought everybody here tonight. Thank you. Lord, you put him in a special place. Special Lord, he can use the talent that you've given him honor and to glorify you. Bless your holy name. Yes. And then, Lord, to help us. All of us come together and worship you more strongly in spirit and in truth. Yes. Lord, as we pray tonight before the service, I just feel like confessing this. In my Bible, I have written that every one of us should ask as we leave the facility, Lord, that my worship leads you tonight. Yes, yes. I know Jeff wants the worship to please you, God. Yes. Yes. Every fiber of his being. Yes. Bless him. Yes. Equip him. Yes. Give him the strength, Fill Lord, to do whatever spirit, needs Lord, to be done. Father, we will rejoice together at the things you are doing here at this church that we might spread the gospel yes. to all the world. Yes. We love you, Jesus. Yes. We love our pastors. We love our congregation. Lord, we just pray for your blessings tonight. In your precious name I pray. Yes. Amen. 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 Awesome. Thank you, brother. Love you. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I appreciate it. I love you more. <laughs> oh, man. All right, so listen, how about some progress tonight? You guys want some progress? I want progress. I, 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 don't, I, I don't know about y'all, but I don't want to play church, man. We could join the country club in Mount Dora if we want to join a social club. We want to, we want to have some progress here tonight. That's the reason why you came here tonight was to progress and, and for, for, for you to become less of you and more of Jesus and that this church would be, would be filled with his power and progress, right? He's trying to build something here. And last week, man, I don't even, I'm getting fired up because I think I'm trying to make up for something. Like last week, how are we going to top that? Like really, right? How are we going to top last week? Like uh, it, that was insane awesomeness. That you guys, I mean, the, the, the testimony of my buddy Chris there who had the stroke. Like how, how are we going to top that thing, right? How are we going to top that? And then you guys all got up and, and you shared your testimonies and we, we listened to how God has delivered you from, from addiction and bad circumstance and saved you and built back relationships and, and prospered you and, and delivered you and, and provided for you in these supernatural ways. It was incredible, right? And, I, and we all said, I want to see that. Yeah. I don't, I'm, I don't want to just read about it in the Bible. I want to see it in my life. And, and last week we got to see some of that stuff. But let me ask you this. Are you satisfied? I'm not. I'm so not satisfied. I don't even feel like my, cap, my cup is half full. I, I want more, right? I want to see more. I, I, want, I want God to show off. And I want to see his power come and, and, and manifest itself every single time we're here. I want to talk to you today about an each day God, right? Not just yesterday, not what he did for you yesterday, what he did for you yesterday or what he did for you. I want to see him do something for me today. I want to see him do something for me. I want to see that. Is, is anyone, am I the only one in the room who wants to see that? I think, I think you guys are sleeping out there, man. Do me a favor and open up your Bible to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 is where we're going to feast tonight. I'm, 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 I'm desperate for progress tonight. That, that's it. That's the word. Progress. I, I am, we, you, I'm, I'm coming after you tonight right here. I'm telling you right now. And, 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 and God's word is powerful here in Acts chapter 2. And it's, listen, it's, 
I'm going to call you at the end of the ch- I'm going to call you at the end of the church service, and I'm going to call you to do something. And it's going to take guts, but it's it. We're looking for progress here, man. And 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 time is short. And I don't know how much longer I'm going to be alive or you're going to be alive. I I want to see progress. Desperately want to see the the kingdom of God advance in this community. I'm talking to pastors here locally, and and they're all believing that God wants to do something incredible in this area, and they don't know what it is. And I've been sensing it since I was working at that stupid car dealership back there at Advantage Chrysler when everyone was moving here, and I'm asking them why, and they're like, I don't know, but I, I, I believe this is where God wanted me to be. Like, I didn't even know you were a Christian. Why are you even saying that? And everyone was saying that, and he's bringing people here, and it's not a waste of time. He determines when nations rise and fall. So why would he bring population of his people to this area in abundance lest he was trying to do something? It's It's not a mistake. It's not a coincidence. There's a reason. And I want to see it in my lifetime. Lest, lest the clouds open and, and, and Jesus comes back to take us. Like, that would be awesome. But short of that, I want to see it happen in my lifetime. And I want to see it happen tonight, right here. Desperately, that's been my prayer. <coughs> but I think, <clears throat> you know, like I had a cold the last couple of days, and so a lot of you prayed for me. I thank you for that, but I'm still a little bit congested. So <coughs> I might not be able to get as excited <clears throat> as I might normally be because otherwise I'll start gagging to death but I think that we're settling people I think that we settle I think that everyone on earth settles but I think more so than that I don't want to talk about the people that are outside of the church I want to talk about the people that are in the church the ones who have tasted and seen that the Lord is good right you know you know that he's awesome Everyone in this room, I know all of you, and all of you I know have had experiences with God. I've talked to every single one in this room, and I know you've had experiences with God where you know that He is awesome, and you know there's a ton more for you that you have available to you, but you won't go after it, and I won't go after it. We're all settling people, and I don't want to see that anymore. Too many people in the church of Christ are settling for good instead of pursuing the great, and, I, and listen, that's what I would say, but... But, but dead smart people, they say it better. This is how C.S. Lewis puts it. You know who C.S. Lewis is? The Chronicles of Narnia guy, super smart. This is what he said. It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. That's us. Pecking on the ground like a chicken when he wants us to soar in the sky like an eagle. And listen, I'm not like yelling at you guys like I've made it and you're down here. I'm the eagle and you're the chicken. That is not it. When I was preparing this message this week, (coughs) I was thinking and pondering, and this came to mind. I remember, and this is a secular uh, example, but you guys know that I was in the golf business for years and years before I got to this place in my life, and I was actually a pretty decent player. Um, To the average person, you know, the the average American golfer can't break 100. Did you know that? So, no, not yet. You don't need to look at that guy. Look here, look here. Okay, the average American golfer, I don't know if it's you or not, but you can't, you can't break 100. So I was a pretty good golfer. I could shoot in the high 70s, low 80s. That was what I would do. And that's pretty good for the average everyday guy. But the thing about my golf game is that all my coaches and my, my high school coach and, the, and my pros that would teach me and give me lessons they all said I had an absolutely gorgeous golf swing, like textbook golf swing. And so like I could have been really good, and I wanted to be good, but I didn't want to do what it took to be good. You know, I practiced. I went to the driving range, and I hit balls. I hit a few buckets of balls. 
And then when I got done, I'd go inside the clubhouse and have lunch, and I'd go back out, and I'd chip and putt for an hour or so. And I would be okay, and that's why you guys maybe can't break 100, but that's why I could break 80, so that was pretty good. But I guess I just didn't want it that bad. And so I'd rather drink and fart around with my buddies and joke around and chase girls and, you know, all the things that I... fooling about with drink and sex and ambition, right? That was me. And so I never made it. And I went off to do other things, but that guy that was up on the screen, you see him there? You know who that is? Most people wouldn't know who he is. See, there was a, his name is Zach Johnson. When I was a golfer and I realized I wasn't, cut out to play for a living because I didn't want to do what it took to get it, I took the path of least resistance. Rather than going to the driving range and hitting balls till my hands bled, I decided to be a rules official. So I was a golf referee and so I did that. Because it's a lot easier to study a book than to sit at the driving range and pound balls till you're bleeding. So that's what I did. And when I was working as a, as a rules official, there was a young kid named Zach Johnson that was playing on the tour that I worked on. And this kid couldn't break 80. But he desired something great when I desired something good. And so every single night when he, this young kid would post his score of 80, 81, 79, 82, not that good at all. You, you know, to, to make it on tour, you've got to shoot in the 60s every day. So he was a chop, but he wanted something great. And every single night when everyone else was done and I was done working and I was at my motor home drinking beer and cooking steak on the grill, having a good time with my buddies doing drinking contests with putting, he was on the driving range hitting balls till his hands were bleeding. And now he's the 12th leading money winner in the history of the game. He's won 12 times internationally, including two majors. He's won the Masters, and he's won the British Open, and he's accumulated over $43 million playing golf. So I guess I just didn't want it, but Zach did. He pursued greatness while I was content with pursuing things in the moment that were good. And that's why you're looking at him going, wow. I think it turned out okay. I'm happy with my life. And God redeemed my foolishness and helped me get to where I am now. And I'm, I wouldn't trade standing before you right now for that money. But at the time, I would have. <laughs> That's a, a secular example for sure, but it sure speaks of a person's priorities, doesn't it? Listen, you will always invest in the thing that you think is most important. All of us, all the time. You'll spend money on it. You'll talk about it. You'll make plans to try to see it come to pass and prosper. You'll think about it. You'll tell your friends about it. You might even pray about it. Whatever resources you have at your disposal, whether it's time, or energy, or, or intellectual capital, or relationships, money, anything. You'll freely give it to that thing because you think that's the most important thing. And every single one of us has a thing. Everyone has a thing. And you've either made a conscious choice, hey, this is my thing. You, you may have made a declaration out loud in, in public. This is the most important thing to me. Maybe you've done that, but most of us don't do that. Most of us just passively kind of swerve into that lane and we end up just doing the thing that we think is most important and we give ourselves over to that thing. So we might not make a declaration, but a story is told when we look at our wallet and we look at our agenda. And you might not say, you know... Uh, my career is the most important thing. My wife is the most important thing. My children are the most important thing. My career, my house, my stuff, golf is the most. I don't know if you've ever done that. 
Maybe you just look at your life and it tells a story because all of us have a thing. So listen, it would be foolish if I said all this and didn't stop and say, what's your thing? Don't just yell out Jesus. Because I'm going to tell you right now that there's probably, I'm just, I guess, according to God's word that you're about to hear, I don't know if anyone can yell out freely, Jesus. We all have work to do. I know guys and gals in this room that are very, very into him. But I don't know what your standard is that, de that decides whether you're really into him or not. We need to look into God's word to see that. And I don't know what your thing is. And I don't know if you've actually thought it through and made a choice and made the declaration. But your life definitely will tell a story. I don't know what your thing is, but I do know what your thing's supposed to be. And most of the time I say, look in your Bible and look at this verse. <clears throat> don't bring up the next slide yet. But I'm about to take you to the verse in Scripture. I'm a little biased. It's my favorite verse in all of, the, of, of God's Word. All of it. A lot of verses in there, right? We go across the room and you can all tell me what your favorite verse is. This is my favorite verse. The reason why I love this verse and the reason why I'm using it tonight is because I think that it's apropos for every single person on earth who's ever lived and ever will because every single one of us wonders why we're here. Why, why, how do we get here and what's my life supposed to be about? What's my thing? And we're chasing different things. Some of them are right, some of them are wrong. We're chasing them in the right way. We're chasing them in the wrong way. What is the meaning of my life? What's my life to be? If you get this thing that I'm about to share with you, it sets the foundation for the rest of your life, and it sets the trajectory for your whole eternity. And if you get this, everything else makes sense. But if you don't get this one thing, it doesn't matter what you get. You get nothing. And it's not about the holiness of God. It's not about the justice of God. It's not about purity. It's not about faith. It's not about love. It's really not even about God. It's about you. Because no matter what happens, if, none of, if, if, if anyone in this universe never drew another breath, he's God. He doesn't need you for him to be God. But if you're going to live the life that he's designed and created you for, you got to get this. It's Colossians 1.16. Bring it up on the screen, please. That's it right there. Everything was created by him and for him. That's it. That, 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 that covers everything. Why, why are you here? What got you here and why are you here? That, that's the thing. Your thing, according to your creator, is him. That's what he wants you to choose as your thing. And we're all racing around doing all this other stuff. And that doesn't mean you tuck them into the nooks and crannies. He said your main thing, the, the, the one, the singular thing that you would pour the majority of your resources to most easily and most aggressively toward is Him. Amen. That's why you live. That's why you're about to draw the next breath. It's for Him. That's why. And I think that when I say that we're settling people, one of the ways that we settle is that we, we, we agree to the first part, like the, the, the created part, right? Do you know like 1% of our population is atheist? So I'm not going to deal with those knuckleheads. Only a fool says in their heart there is no God, so there's no sense in talking to them. But you're not. You're sitting here, right? Everyone thinks that God created them. Now, you might call God something different. There's different religions out there that call God this and call God that, and they might not know who the real God is, but they believe that they were created by this divinity up there that's riding on the clouds. Everyone believes it, and that's good. 
but they don't embrace and believe the for him part. They believe the created by part, but they don't embrace the for him part. And that's what we want to discover here tonight. We want to invade that space. What does for him mean? And here's what for him means. It's found right here in Acts chapter 2. So I'm going to read some of Acts chapter 2, and then I'm going to jump over to Acts chapter 4, and we're going to read a little bit from there as well. You have your Bible open? I hope so. You wouldn't want the preacher to call you a slacker. Not in front of everybody. So, they just had Pentecost. Holy Spirit shows up in a powerful way. The people are infused with his power. And Peter gets up. This is context. Peter gets up and he preaches <coughs> his first message. The once coward who was afraid to even identify himself as a Christian because Jesus had been arrested and he didn't want to be arrested. So he cowers and says, I'm not even one of his. Now he watches Jesus go to the cross and get whipped and beaten and murdered. But because the Holy Spirit is now in him, this coward is now boldly standing up and preaching aggressively to the crowd of thousands and saying, Rome and Jewish people, you killed this guy. And he's God. And, and repent and turn. Like he's, he's preaching his guts out. And 3,000 people 3,000, you think Billy Graham's good? 3,000 people come to the Lord right then and there, and they get baptized. That's awesome. Listen, he's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. Do you not think he wants to do that now? I think he does. I think he does for sure. You're going to see that. 3,000 people get saved. And then it says, very next verse, Verse 42, 42, you ready? After the 3,000. Verse 42, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including communion, the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over all of them, or them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Now turn to chapter 4. Mom, I do need my glasses, please. 432, continue the story here. All the believers were united in heart and mind, and they felt that what they owned was not their own, so they shared everything they had. Thank you, beautiful. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's great blessing was upon them all. There was no needy people among them because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. And then he goes on and gives an example of this guy, Joseph, known as Barnabas. He owned land in Cyprus, which history tells us that the wealthy people lived there. And it was filled with lots of natural resources, and so he's probably wealthy, but I don't know. But he sold a field that he owned, and he brought the money to the apostles. And then there's a story that no one wants to hear about, Ananias and Sapphira, who didn't do the right thing, and they died on the spot. So let me just say this. There's a lot there in that story. There's a lot there in that text. But the first thing that's perfectly clear, and you cannot miss it, is that all of them, all of them, let me read Holman Christian Standard for a second, because I saw something that I never noticed before. In my Bible, and you were reading the New Living Translation there, most of you, you saw that there was a break in the paragraph. After verse 41, when there was 3,000 added, then there was a break. That break is not divine. That's translators doing that. 
And there's a title to the chapter. Forming community and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so I was reading that in this Bible here. And I noticed that they changed the break of the paragraph in the Holman Christian Standard Bible. And they included chap uh, verse 41 in that text, in that section. And it just, just let me just read this and see if you just kind of pick up on something that's just a little nuanced. It just made me think. So those who accepted his message were baptized. This is when Peter preached. And that day about 3,000 people were added to them. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking the bread. Those 3,000 people, they did not come to the altar and make a confession and have a conversion. They became a disciple and a follower right then and there. There was no confession of faith and saying, well, I'm, I'm a believer now and I just want to make sure my heaven is secure. No, they made a decision. They got baptized and then they instantly, that day, devoted themselves to Jesus and his mission. And that is what we're looking for. That's what we're looking for. Jesus and his mission of seeking and saving and building and growing his kingdom, the church, that was the thing of all 3,120 people on the spot. That was it. They made a decision that this is what my life is all about. It's not a, it's not a conversion. It's not a confession. It's, it's, it's a decision that this is my thing. This is it. Now, what, what caused this decision? What would make over 3,000 people who have been following a certain faith now, a history of thousands of years, why would they all of a sudden decide to leave that, that faith and make a decision to not just say goodbye to it, but to fully entrench themselves in a completely different thing? What would make someone do that? What would make a Boston Celtic fan all of a sudden jump ship and be a Lakers fan? What would, what would it take for a Yankee fan to say, you know what, I'm a Red Sox fan now? You would never do that, right? So that, what's, that's nothing. How about being a Jew for thousands of years, right? And all of a sudden you change your mind completely and say, no, I'm not doing that anymore. Now I'm totally doing this. And it's not just a confession of faith. I've made a decision to devote myself to something. Why would you do that? The New Living Translation says that there was a deep sense of awe that came over them all. That's why. That's weak. That's weak. I, I'm so tired of people watering down God's word, right? I'm so sick and tired. This is one of my pet, everyone have, you guys have pet peeves? I have a pet peeve. I hate when people change God's word. It drives me freaking crazy, right? It is written! And, and, and in, I'm so tired of people saying, well, when God's word says fear, it's, it's reverent. No, it's not. Look it up. Don't tell me what you think it is because it makes your Jesus more palatable. He doesn't need your stinking help, right? He's not palatable. He's tough to swallow. And, and, he's, and the Bible says that there was fear that came over them all. It's not awe. It's the Greek word phobos, right? You know what word we get from that? You guys are smart. Phobia, right? Phobias of snakes and phobias of spiders. I have a phobia of water. I don't go in the, sh you know what, I'll let you into a little secret of my wimpy life. When I go in the shower, how many people love to get in the shower and just let the water just bead down right in their face and ah, oh, right? Show me your hands. You're all crazy. I'm petrified of it. So I get in the shower and I let it hit my back and I stand like this the whole time. Listen, I, I, there's no, I don't have awe of the water. I'm not in awe of the water. I'm scared of it. Right? Because Lance Mayhofer, my instructor for swimming when I was in turtles, I wouldn't graduate to dolphins, so he took my head and he slammed it under the water. I'm scared of water. Like, that's what they do to babies now. I think that's sick. I don't like that. It's, I'm, I'm 49 years old. I still remember that dude's name. 
I was like six, right? So I was, I'm scared, right? Who's, there's no awe in phobias, is there? No, you're frightened to death. The word phobos does not mean awe. It mean, it's the Greek word that translates, it's alarm, fright, exceedingly afraid, or terror. It's not awe. They were scared to death of Jesus. Why were they scared of him? Well, I don't know. I'm going to build my church and, and, and hell won't stop it. And I'm going to get arrested. I'm going to get whipped, beaten, mocked, crucified, and I'm going to rise again. And then in John chapter uh, 20, verse 19, it says the disciples were all locked up behind lock and key in a room, and Jesus walks through the wall and says, what's up? That's why they were scared. Because before, he was like their leader, and they admired him, and he was doing great things. But it was at that point they realized that they were standing in the presence of the Creator. Of course they were scared. What happens every time that the manifest presence of God shows up, the angel of the Lord? What's the first thing they say? Don't be afraid. Why? Because everyone's like, ah! What would you do if God showed up in this room right now? You'd be scared to death, and so would I, because he's a consuming fire. You look at him and you die. That's who he is. And they were standing in the presence of the Creator. So of course they were scared. He walked through a wall. Can your car do that? Can your spouse do that? Can your career do that? Can your money do that? How about your cat or your house or your friends or anything else that you would give yourself over to? Are any of them that awesome and that worthy of being your thing? Of course not. And so they made a decision, Jesus Christ and his mission to build the church, that's my thing. Forever, that's my thing. Not a convert, but a disciple and a follower of Jesus. And I'm not sure if all 3,000 of them made a verbal declaration. Like, they got baptized, that's awesome. But I don't know that they all stood up after they got up out of the water and said, hey, listen, every, all the rest of you 2,900 people, I'm, I'm going to be following Jesus for the rest of my life. That's what my things are. I don't know if they ever made a declaration of the sort like that. But one look at the story, and you know that their lives told a story. You made me, God. And if your church is the main thing to you, then it's the main thing to me. And that's what we're looking for. And I think that we're not doing that. I don't know anybody that's doing that. I'm not doing that. I should be doing that. I want to be doing that. I want to make progress tonight. You guys want to make progress in that. I want to be like that. That's what I want to be. And so, this is what for him looks like. I need a drink of water. This is what for him looks like. It's wrapped up in one word. It's devoted. That's what for him looks like, to be devoted to him. Not just get up to the altar and, 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 and say a prayer. Lord, I'm a sinner. I need you to forgive me. Forgive me my sin. Come into my heart and be my savior. That's awesome. Where in that confession did you say, I'm going to follow you and do exactly what you want every day for the rest of my life? Who says that in their confession? The answer is no one. No one's doing that. But that's what it means when he says, for him, it's to be devoted to him. Not just playing around with it. I usually put a definition up on the screen, but it's too much. Here's what devoted is. Devoted is to be given over to zealous or ardent. Zealous is like uh, mindlessly just going after that thing, right? At all cost. Ardent means passionate. So I'm given over to it, like, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to give my resources to. And I'm ten <coughs> tenacious and crazy about it. And I'm not thinking about it. I'm just doing it. <coughs> I'm given over to <coughs> zealous or ardent in attachment, Right? I've given myself to you, Lord, and your purposes, and I'm not letting go of that. Hell or high water, I'm never turning away from you. Do you understand? 
That's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm, I'm passionate and given to, 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 I'm good, brother. I'm good. I'm, I'll, I could never do it and talk at the same time. I couldn't do it and talk at the same time, but I love you. I'm, I'm given over or zealous or ardent in attachment, loyalty, or affection to concentrate on a particular pursuit, to concentrate on a particular purpose, or to concentrate on a particular cause, to dedicate by a formal act or to, consent, or to consecrate. The question is, is, are you devoted? And not devoted compared to everybody else. Are you devoted to compared to what God's word says it means to be devoted? Are, are, you, are you passionate in your loyalty? Like I have, I've known people over the years in, in this church, I'm not calling out any names, but I know people in this church who I know and love who talk a big game. And they say they're absolutely about this thing. We're going to do this thing. You know what ardent in, in attachment and loyalty is? That means you step into this room in 5, 10 15 or 20 years, unless they're dead, they're still here on their knees praying. They're still here serving the Lord and singing to the Lord and serving His people. And they never stop. That's what following it with devotion means. And that's what the church should be known for. Never stopping. Always going forward. More and more, Lord. How can I serve you greater? I'm, I'm passionate about this. And I'm never going to stop. It's not a hobby. It's not a season. You know, if I hear one more Christian say, well, it's for a season. Really? Would you just consider this, loved ones, that a season doesn't have to be short? It's an excuse for dodging and getting out of here. Why can't a season be the season of your life? Right? Why can't it be? Why has it got to be a season? Well, I was here for a year or two, and now I'm being called over here. Really? Why can't a season be for a lifetime? Couldn't it be? My, I know my season's for a lifetime. Until I stroke out on this stage, you're going to have to look at me. That's it, because I know what God's called me to do. He said, I want you to passionately pursue my kingdom right there at that church. Open that book and tell them about me to your last breath. That's what you're supposed to do. And I'm not going to stop. I don't care what anyone says. I'm going to do it. So are you devoted? See, I think another way that we settle is that we kind of sample these things, but we're not devoted to them. Like you'll date Jesus, but you won't put a ring on his finger. Ow! Right? Ooh, now it's getting good. That's the problem that we have. We sample these things, we try these things, we tuck them into the nooks and crannies of our life, and we'll date Jesus, but we will not put a ring on his finger. And that's a problem in the church. We lack devotion. What are the things that they were devoted to? Let's get specific, okay? They were devoted to six things specifically. You see them there in the text. The apostles teaching and praise God. They wrote some of that stuff down, right? They wrote some of that stuff down in the Bible, the apostles that were teaching. And someone will say, well, see, it's not all there, so how do we know that we're, we're getting it all right? Yeah, you haven't even studied or memorized the stuff that's already there, so don't complain about it. The apostles' teaching, which is the word of God, they were devoted to fellowship. They were devoted to meals, including communion. They were devoted to prayer, devoted to generosity, and they were devoted to worship. That's what the Jesus Christ freaks, the church. That's what they were devoted to, those six things. Let's just go through those things quickly, can we? The first one is the apostles' teaching, the word of God. Now, why, why, did, why were they devoted to the word of God? Well, First and foremost, and this should be sufficient, because God said so. He said, study to show yourself approved, a workman unto God, who need not be ashamed. You can walk right up and say, hey, I can quote the Bible. I know it. I can rightly divide the word of truth. I know it. He didn't say, I think it's a good idea that you guys should study it. He said, study it. So, radical obedience. Can we just start there? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. He said, do it, so do it. He walked through walls. Listen to him. Right? He said to, to do it. But why, 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 why? Like, God doesn't need you to memorize verses. He's still going to be God. Whether you believe it or not, whether you memorize it or not, whether you study it or not, he's God. Why does he want us to be devoted to the word of God? Well, because every word of God is God-breathed. 
and it's beneficial for teaching us. So we want to learn, and it says that God uses it to prepare his people for every good work. So every single good thing that he would want you to do with your life as a Christ follower, when you said, yes, I want to be a Jesus follower, now what? The way to learn what to do is found in the word of God. He uses this to prepare his people for every good work. That's why. He also, like he said this to Joshua, in the fifth book of the Bible, he says to Joshua, the guy who came after Moses, the leader of Israel that brought them actually into the promised land, he said the only way, he told Joshua, he said the only way you're going to succeed in all of your endeavors is if you study the word, meditate on the word, and obey the word of God. That's the only way that you're going to be successful in all of your endeavors. So why does he want you devoted to the word of God? It's for you. He's still God whether you do it or not. Why does he want you to study it? So that you would do well. So that for his glory and your blessing and your flourishing. This, he says a similar thing to the psalmist in Psalm 1. He says that those that delight in the law of the Lord, who meditate on it day and night, they will never wither, but they will prosper in everything that they do. See, there's a way for you to maximize the blessings of God. And the question is, is do you want weekly blessing? Do you want monthly blessing? Or do you want each day blessings? See, I, I, I know that over the years in this church, we've had probably 250 people give their life to Christ and, and go in the tank. Like, that's awesome. But that's pathetic. We have 300,000 people in Lake County. Over 300,000. The latest census says there's 28,000 people in Leesburg alone. So what's 250 people that have got baptized in eight years? I mean, it's good. Let's rejoice. It's awesome, right? But are you satisfied with that? Does it line up with the fact that God desires that every person is saved and comes to an understanding of the truth? Right? He saved 3,000 in one day. So do you think he's satisfied and content with 250 over the last eight years here? Like, I know churches that have thousands of people in it that don't have that much. So that's good compared to other churches, but that's not the standard that's been set for us. The standard is God, and he wants all people saved. So each day blessings is what we're looking for. That's what I want. I love, you know, one of my favorite baptisms in the history of this church? My favorite baptisms are the ones that happen on Wednesday night. <coughs> the ones that happen at our pool on a Tuesday. The ones that happen in my bathtub, because my buddy Chris, that guy there, I don't know if you know this, he called me years ago. He had some youth in his youth group that wanted to give his life to Christ and get baptized. He didn't have a garden tub at his house, and he was at a Methodist church. They don't dunk, but Chris dunks. And so he said, Moses, can I use your tub? Are, you, are you home? No. Can I use your tub? Yes. He went over there with his whole youth group, crowded into my bathroom, filled it up, and baptized some kid in my bathtub. That's awesome. And that's what we want to see happen, right? An each day God. An each day God. I don't even know what day of the week it was. But they weren't in church. They were at their youth group. So I don't know, was it a Wednesday night or a or Friday night or a Sunday night or something? But that's when it happened. So they were devoted to the Word of God. So they, they studied it. The Word of God. Devoted is, is, is reading it and obeying it daily. Yes. Do you understand that? Yeah. Reading and obeying it daily. That's what being devoted to the Word of God means. Not some part-time reading. Okay, I'm going to be here for a while, guys, so just... And I hope you're good. I want you to learn, and I want, to, I want progress tonight so bad. I'm going to call you up. Listen, here's the second thing they were devoted to, to fellowship. Another very weak word. It's translated... The, the Greek word is koinonia, and it's translated fellowship. That's the translation. But the definition of koinonia, when you look it up in the Strong's Concordance, it's not fellowship. It's partnership and participation. That's what 
koinonia is. That's really what fellowship is. It's not gaining, getting together in the fellowship hall to have fellowship, to hang out with other Christians and talk about the Cleveland Cavaliers. No, it's partnering in something. It's participating in something. Okay, now listen. To get the real gist of what that means, I don't want to give you an example. I want to give you the Bible, okay? So do me a favor. Look in 1 John. I, I've, read the, I've read through the Bible several times, but I never remember reading this, but it was like so awesome. 1 John chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. Go there for a second. Tell me when you're there. This is so awesome. This is what fellowship is. You guys there? Okay. Verse 6. If we say we have fellowship with him, him is capitalized, it's God, right? If we say we have fellowship with God, so participation and, and, and partnership with God, but we walk in darkness, so if we're not like living like Jesus, putting down our bad stuff and picking up his good stuff, if, we're, if we say we have this thing with him, but we're walking in darkness, we're lying and not practicing the truth. So we're not even a Christian. So you could say you're a Christian, but if you're not acting like a Christ follower should act according to the word of God, you're not a Christian, you're just fooling yourself. Right? That's, that's why James says if you're just a hearer of the word, but you're not a doer of the word, you're just deceiving yourself. You're not a Christian. You're, you're a reader of a good book. Right? So he says... If we have fellowship with God, then, then we're going to be walking in the light as God is in the light. We're going to be living, li and, and, and li we're going to be living like Jesus would. Do you guys all get that? Are we in agreement there? Okay. Verse 7. But if we do walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, so that's good. So if we are a Christian and we have fellowship with God, then we have fellowship with one another. So, so what this is saying here is that true connection with God always fleshes out visibly by us connecting and partnering and participating in the mission of Jesus with each other. Ephesians 4 tells us that he, he places us together. And as each of us does their own special work, it helps the others to grow. We serve each other. If we have a connection vertically with God, then we will always have participation, actively participating with others in the church in building his kingdom. It's never one or the other. You have to have both. Growth is the goal. Always. Jesus said, I'm building my church. So growth is always the goal active partnering and participating in building Jesus church with each other that's what we do all the time that's fellowship Greg I want I want to build Jesus church with you how can we do that together because the triple braided cord is not easily broken. So let's stand together and do something awesome. Let's, in, let's get Holly involved in that. How can we work together, Susan and Debbie? And how, how, Greg, come on. How do we do this together to build the kingdom? It's not about the preacher doing it. It's not about the, the worship pastor. It's, it's you. How, how can we do this together? Let's, you got to be actively participating in the mission that Jesus has to build his church. That's what fellowship is, okay? And they were devoted to that. That means I'm in, I'm passionate about it, and I'm never stopping. That's what that means. That's what devoted to fellowship is. The next one's super easy. It's meals. We got that one? Everybody's good at that. But there's more. Because... It wasn't just me. How many people enjoy a good steak, right? I enjoy a good steak. How about pizza, Tom? Oh, yeah. yeah, oh yeah, I didn't have to finish the A in pizza. He was like, yeah. Everybody likes good food, right? But see, they weren't just, they weren't just devoted to having Ricky over for dinner. That's good. I like Ricky, you can come over for dinner anytime. That's cool. And we can invite our buddies over for dinner and we can have a good old time, right? That's fun. We should do that. You should be hospitable. But you see, they also added into that and communion. Amen. And communion. Because 
If you can have a good steak, that's good. But if you can take that steak and pause, and during that awesome dinner with your buddies and brothers and sisters in the Lord, and stop to acknowledge the one who made that steak, then that steak goes beyond your taste buds. It becomes a spiritual experience. And communion is supposed to be a time where we stop and we remember the Lord. And we remember what He did on the cross. And we remember this, this Everest of sin that we had in our life that Jesus came to get rid of that for us. And that He was whipped and beaten and died willfully to pay for your sin, to become sin so you could become righteous. That's what we do when we get around the table, when we're devoted to meals and communion. That's what that's all about. That's what that's all about. They were, listen, they were devoted to that. They didn't just wait for Thanksgiving to say, oh, I'm going to be a good Christian now, and I'm going to have someone over for Thanksgiving. No, they were devoted to meals, including communion. That means passionate, all the time, never stopping. Here's the fourth thing they were devoted to. This is the worst. It's the worst thing for me. They were devoted to prayer. We can get Ricky to come up here and preach about that one, because I'm hopeless. <laughs> He, he's the only guy I know that's devoted to prayer. And, he, and he, I bet you if I asked him, and not, and not to put you in the spot, I bet you if I asked him, he would tell me he don't pray enough. Because he doesn't. Nobody does. And I'm not saying I don't pray. I pray. I do struggle with prayer. That's the thing that on this list probably falls off my table quicker than anything else. Anybody with me? Prayer. Let me ask you a question. Why do you feel as though it falls off the table. Why do you feel as though there's a deficit in your prayer life? You don't do it enough, maybe? You don't do it the right way? We all have these reasons. I think they're all bogus. Because you set standards, as I do, about how I should pray and when I should pray and what I should pray about. But who cares about what you think? All right? And who cares about what I think? If we're going to talk about being devoted to praying to the creator of the universe, then we need to set our standard of praying based on his standard. And so this is what his standard is. 1 Timothy 2.1 says, I urge you, first of all, this is Paul speaking to his number one student. His number one student, Timothy. He says, first of all, let me tell you this. Now, you could put a lot of things in there. You could, you could, I mean, if you were Paul and you were teaching your number one student who is going to be an amazing, amazing follower of Jesus that's going to actually be in the Bible, you could teach about, listen, first of all, you've got to teach your people about love, right? You could do that. First of all, you've got to teach people about faith. Or first of all, you've got to teach people about God's holiness. Because if you don't get His holiness, you walk in front of Him and do the wrong thing, he'll, he'll smite you. There's a lot of things that God could talk about, that Paul could talk about, about God, that are super, super important, right? What does he say? I urge you, first of all, pray for all people. I don't do that. You pray for a lot of people, but do we pray for all people? Do we pray for all people? Even the people you hate? Even the people who are so entrenched in sin that you'd like to put a bullet in their head? Do you pray for them? That's the first standard. And then he says in Philippians 4, 6, to pray about everything. What's on your radar today? Pray about it. What are you concerned about? I don't know. Pray about it. What are you fearful of? Pray about it. What do you need? Pray about it. What are, you gonna do? what are you supposed to do today? I don't know. Pray about it. What should I wear today? Pray about it. Where should I go? Pray, pray, pray. Pray about everything. Pray, 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 pray about, it. To every, about every person and, and about everything. And then in 1 Thessalonians 5 somewhere, it says, and pray without ceasing. So, so if I said, are you devoted to prayer? And you shot your hand up and said, yo, I am. Okay, let me ask you a question. Are you praying for all people, for everything, in every moment? No. Now listen, hear me. I'm not telling you as some legalistic preacher that says 
that you have to do that or else you're out of God's graces or you have to do it because you're not going to go to heaven if you don't. I'm not saying that. But that is the gold standard of being devoted to prayer. And that's what you should be shooting for. You will probably never get there. But that's what devoted to prayer looks like. Don't let Ricky set your standard. Don't let me set your standard. Mimi prays a lot. My wife Meredith prays a lot. They pray a ton. Don't let them pray, set your standard. Let God set your standard. You want to be devoted. Listen, we're looking for an each day blessing. You get each day blessings when you're devoted to these things. Four times in Scripture, the same thing is repeated. Why is it repeated in God's Word? Why is something repeated in God's Word? Because it's important, right? It's not that God forgot. Oh, man, I can't believe I mentioned that in Matthew already. What are you doing, Mark? That's not what he's saying. <laughs> Divinely inspired, breathed by the Holy Spirit of God, on, perfect, on, on purpose and perfect, four times, God says, my temple, my house, will shall be called a house of prayer. So, so whether it's this house, this thing here, the temple, if you will, the building where God's house is, or you personally, New Testament believer, where the Holy Spirit lives in you and the Scriptures say that you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. So whether it's this temple or this temple, Jesus says prayer should be happening in there. Devoted. Devoted to that thing. That's why we do Monday night, man. Monday night is, here is prayer night. From 7 to 8, we come and we pray. We, listen, and it's not a cure for this cancer of not praying. But it's a step towards devotion, isn't it? Amen. Isn't it a step at least? Isn't it our job as the leaders of a church, to, if it says it in the scripture, to create an environment where you can at least have a chance to flourish and devote yourself to prayer? So we do it. And every Monday night we're here, and at least... 75% of you are not here. I'm just calling you out. I told you I'm coming after you. Listen, if you've got kids at home and you can't be here, fine. But if you, if you can be here, why wouldn't you not be? What is more important? Listen, they were devoted to prayer every single day and they wouldn't stop. And he blessed that thing. Monday night from 7 to 8. Be here, man. It's a step towards devotion. Here's the fifth thing that they were devoted to. That means ardent, passionate, committed, attached. I'm not stopping. I'm crazy about this thing. Generosity. 2.44 says, Now all the believers were together and had everything in common, so they sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as anyone had a need. And then go over to chapter 4, verse 32. Now the multitude of those who believed, that means all of them who believed were of one heart and soul. That means they all agreed to this. No, Listen. If, if there were defectors in that group, would God say that? No. He doesn't lie, right? Okay. Every single person who believed, that was 3,120 people, it says all of them were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of his possessions was his own. But instead they held everything in common. For there was no... There was not a needy person among them because all those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid the proceeds at the apostles' feet. This was then distributed to each person as anyone had a need. You know what this means? That means my needs, shh, shh, 
my desires shh, shh, and my plans shh, shh, out the window. Nothing matters anymore. See, see, what, one of the parts of, part of the revelation that these people had in this whole process of what happened, they realized that Jesus had died, had gone to the cross and been whipped and beaten for every person. It wasn't just them. Like, it wasn't just, he died for me. No, he died for Susan. And, and, if, and if God would die on the cross for you, then you must be very important. And so when you start realizing the importance and value of every single person, it becomes easier for you to give to them because you understand how valuable and precious that they are. And that's what happened to these people. And that's why they would just freely give. They realized, nothing I have is mine. It's all yours, and these people need it, and their value. You died for them, so I want to give to them and help them. And so they did. And they didn't stop. Here's the last thing on the list. And it was worship. Now, when I read that, I got a little confused. I mean, because aren't all the five previous things worship? I mean, when, 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 you do, when you lay your desires down and you obey God, even though you don't naturally want to, isn't that attributing value and worth to Him? Like you realize, okay, you're right, you're true, I'm wrong, I'm obeying. That's, a, that's ascribing value and worth to Him when you just do whatever He says instead of whatever you want. Would you not agree to that? Anybody? Okay. But somehow, Luke decides to add worship as a standalone onto the list. For some reason, even though those things are already worship, he adds worship to the list. Why? Because it's clear in God's Word that his desire is that all of his kids would gather in one place and spend some time completely focused on one thing. Him. No football. No vacation pictures. No you. No me. Him. And him alone. And we look at Him, and we pray to Him, and we sing to Him, and we bow before Him, and we listen to Him by hearing His Word and obeying His Word together as one family with one voice focused on Him. And that's why the author of Hebrews says in chapter 10, do not neglect the meeting together as some people make a habit of doing. And I see a lot of that. You see it? That is not what a devoted follower of Christ does. He doesn't pick and choose what weekend is convenient for him or her to come and gather and worship the great king. That's not what a devoted follower does. That's what a non-believer does. Devoted people are passionate and committed zealous, ardent about coming to gather to worship. That's what they do. And there's no beating around the bush here. You know me, but I'm not going to do that. There's no such thing in this book that says you come when you want. <coughs> it doesn't happen. All 3,000 people all 3,000 people, upon conversion, made a decision of their will that Jesus and his mission was their thing. That is what they were devoted to. Not simply a conversion, but a devotion. That's the what. That's what they were devoted to. But what about the where? Where? What about the where? Like, wh where were they devoted to this thing? One of the ways that we settle also is by 
limiting our worship and our fellowship, our participation and our partnership with Jesus into one place. You know, you guys have probably heard the person say, well, I, I love God and, and I pray and I'm charitable, but I don't go to church. I was called out of the church. Or there's the other person like the sheriff of Nottingham in, 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 in Robin Hood who, who um, Friar Tuck is upset about something because he takes the money from the poor box and Friar Tuck starts yelling at him and, and Sheriff Nottingham says what a lot of people in this country say, hey, uh, Friar, keep your preaching to yourself. It's not even Sunday. I get that sometimes when I start talking about the Lord on Facebook. Keep your preaching to the church, man. It's not Sunday. I, I, I didn't sign up for this. And we limit our church involvement to one place and one time. Well, clearly, according to the text, both of these views are completely wrong. Clearly, fellowship, partnership, and participation in the church and building it up is to be done in the building as well as in homes. Here's a bunch of different translations here, just in case you doubt. Reading here in Acts chapter 2, it says that they were, in the English Standard Version, they were attending the temple together and in their homes. Uh, Berean Study Bible, they continued to meet daily in the temple courts and break, breads from how, break bread from house to house. New American Standard, day by day, continuing in the temple and house to house. King James, the only Bible, right? In the temple and from house to house. Every version says the same. Unified in its translation. Every one of them. People were meeting in the temple and in homes. Now, why, why if, if, if great worship and participation with the Lord and building His kingdom was happening in the temple, why would He want them to go to the homes? It was already happening there, right? And it was. Do you guys enjoy coming here? I enjoy coming here. This is my favorite day of the week right here. I'm going to tell the people on Sunday the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Prayer night's my favorite. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it is. On Monday, that's my favorite day. Tonight's my favorite day when, I, when, it's, when it's Saturday. No, but for real, like, I like coming here. It's fun, right? It's a good time. So, 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 so are, are, are we progressing, I think? I think we're making progress. I believe that when the Word of God is proclaimed, that it builds your faith and you advance and you grow. So I believe even if you don't feel it, it's happening. Because I believe God's Word. I don't believe my feelings or anyone's opinion. I believe His Word. And, and when faith is built, it's because you have heard the Word of God. So this is fun. And it's beneficial and we grow. So why house? Why did he tell them to go to houses? Because there was 3,120 of them. So how are we going to break bread together? Like effectively. How are we going to reason together effectively? How are we going to build great relate? Like we have this little thing in the church, you know, our little meet and greet play the cheers song and everyone gets up. Hey, Ricky, I haven't seen you in a week or so. Nice to see you. Hey, and that's the end of Ricky for another week. How many are going to see Ricky during the week? Is it bad to say shame on you all? It's shame on me too. I want to progress in this church. And I don't care if it hurts people's feelings. But how many, I, I'm just going as I feel led. This is Greg. How many people in this room, honestly, show of hands, don't even know who he is? Show your hand. Shame on you. Shame on me. Shame on us. He's part of your church, man. God brought him here. He sits here quietly waiting for you to love him. And he's wanting to love you. I'm putting you on the spot. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> but we should get to know him, right? We can't get to know him here on Saturday night. What happens when the Lord blesses and this place got 350, 400 people in it? How are we going to get to know each other? How are we going to have a family of faith? How do we even call ourselves a family if you don't even know the people that you're sitting in the room with? 
And if there was 5,000 people in here, don't you think we should still get up and get to know people and then meet in homes so that you can get around the table and have communion together and pray for one another? How do you do that in a big old room like this? And this is a small room compared to some churches. Why don't you go to, 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 to what's it called up there? Bill Hybels Church there, uh, Willow Creek. There's 7,000 seats in the auditorium. And on Christmas, they filled it nine times. Whoa. How, how, how are you going to... I mean, so it's good, right? Been there, it's a good. They sing and they preach and it's all great, right? How are you going to get to know one another? How are you going to be devoted, right? So that's why God brought him out of the big room and brought him into the home so they could get to know one another. The vertical thing is great, but the horizontal thing flourishes in smaller settings. Real conversation, real sense of intimacy, real accountability, real growth in relationship. It blossoms and in the home around the table. Do you understand this? That's why we appointed Pastor Ramon to start Rev Groups. And just like prayer on Monday nights, prayer on Monday night is not the solution, but it's a step toward devotion, right? Isn't, I mean, you can't be devoted seven days a week unless, until you're devoted once, right? So we're going to go, let's go for, can we guys, can, we, can you bless your preacher this Monday night? Can, can you just show up and let's just pray? Wouldn't that be awesome if you came in here on Monday night and everyone in this room was there? How awesome would that be, right? And who knows what God would do with that if he sees a people that are totally devoted to him? Who knows what he would do? I don't even know. He might do nothing. But we'll never know unless you try. Right? And so we started this thing, Rev Groups, because we want, we want, to, we want you to at least meet in homes. Like... Decide that you're going to open your home like they did here in the scriptures. You're going to brew up some coffee. You're going to make some cookies. You're going to get over yourself and your schedule. And you're going to go up to Greg and say, I have a rev group on my, at my house on Tuesday nights. Are you doing anything? Not really. Why don't you come over and hang out with us? And we'll go over the pastor's sermon. And we wrote down the verses and we'll talk about it. And we'll spend some time praying for one another and reasoning together and growing together. And then, hey, Greg, what do you got going on in your life? I'd like to pray for you. And you pray for the guy, right? And he prays for you. Like, isn't that what they did? Isn't that what they did? And that's why we want to do this. It's not going to fix the problem, but it's going to be a step towards devotion. So... Listen, I believe that the Lord has placed on my heart that he wants to have five healthy, vibrant rev groups established and functioning by Christmas. Would you get over yourself and go see that man tonight and set up an appointment with him so he can meet with you and tell you what a rev group looks like? It's not difficult. It's not scary. How many people in this room have a home? Raise your hand. Come on, don't put your hand down, you chickens. You have a home, right? That's your only... Do you have a home and a Bible? Who has that? Come on. Everyone's qualified. I have one. Meredith and I have one. Every Tuesday night, we meet. Taco Tuesday at my house. And I have people from this church, including Ramon, Tori, and Ryan. They come, and we do just that. We have tacos. I'm trying to make you jealous, so you'll want to do it. We have tacos, and then we discuss the message. They rip me down to shreds, make me feel like crap. And no, I'm just kidding. And then we pray for one another. What's going on in your life? What's going on in your world? And we pray for his fellow employees and things that's going on in each other's lives and our kids and all that stuff. Man, it's awesome. That's what they did. And that's what they do. So please, don't just let it be an announcement on the screen, man. Let's do this thing. So they were devoted to the word, they were devoted to the fellowship, to the work of the church, devoted to prayer, devoted to gathering, devoted to communion and meals. Where were they devoted? In the church and in the homes. <coughs> and the last, <coughs> the last thing is when were they devoted? <coughs> when did they devote themselves to these things? In the church, in the homes. Please. Here's an awesome verse, Hosea 6.3. It says, as surely as the dawn. How many people believe that the sun's coming up tomorrow? Thank you, sweetheart. 
How often does the sun come up? Every day. Each day you look at the horizon, that sun comes up without fail, right? You can't stop it. It's happening. And, and God's word says, as sure as the sun comes up every day, so will the Lord appear. He, his nature is to show up every single day. That's what he wants to do. And I think that's where we settle big time. See, most folks want God to bless them every day, but they're either chasing the wrong stuff, which he'll never, ever bless, or they're chasing the right thing in the wrong way. See, God does give good gifts to those who ask, but we shouldn't ask for stupid stuff because he's not a stupid stuff dispenser. Do you want a yes from God? You want a yes from God? Okay, if you want a yes for God, from God, then ask for stuff that he wants. Doesn't his word say that he wants everyone to be saved and come to an understanding of the truth? Doesn't his word say that his desire is that not a single one would perish? Doesn't his word say that his desire is that all people now come to repentance and turn to Jesus? That's what his word says. So it, does it surprise you when he saves 3,000 people when they do what he wants? When he, he, that's what he wants. Right? So does it surprise you that he added to the fellowship every day those that were being saved? No, it doesn't surprise me and it doesn't surprise any of us because that's actually what God wants. What should surprise us is our mentality that thinks that he'll add each day when we won't read together each day, when we won't study together, pray together, gather together, eat together, and worship together each day. That's what should surprise us. That we think he's going to do that without doing what he says to do to get it. And I think the, that most of us settle for a once a week God. Or a bi-weekly God. Or a monthly God. Or just on Christmas God and his blessings. When all the while God wants to be an each day God. So what did God do when his people devoted themselves to him every single day? He added to them every single day. So there's a connection there, right? Like, I'm not the smartest guy in the world. But they were devoted each day. And he added each day. Does anyone pick it up on something here? Right? Is, is God at a loss of words? Is he confused? Did he mess up? How many people think that this is the inerrant? That means the perfect word of God. How many people believe that? So if it says each day they did it and each day he added, how many people believe that that's actually worded correctly and actually happened? Raise your hand. Awesome. So there's a connection there, right? Pick up on the connection, man. Pick up on the connection. I want to see that happen. There's a connection. There's a connection. You've got to choose your thing wisely. Because God isn't going to bless your thing if your thing is not his thing. Don't let me lose you here, guys. But if you choose his thing, Jesus and his church, well, then you know he wants to bless that thing, right? It's in his will. He wants all to be saved. He wants none to perish. He wants all to repent. He wants to build his church. So if you ask him, Lord, I want you to build your church right here. Does he want to do that? Does he want thousands and thousands of people? Let me ask you this. There's 300 something thousand people in Lake County. How many of them, is it, let's just say 300,000 is the exact number. How many of the 300,000 does God Almighty, the only God in all of the universe, how many of them does he want in church worshiping him? Exactly. 300,000 of them. So if you ask for what he wants, right, don't you think he's inclined to do that? Yeah. But the problem is, is that you can't get what God wants to give if you won't do what God says to do. And that's where we settle. That's where we settle. There's not a person in this room that wouldn't raise their hand if asked, do you want to see this place crawling with people who didn't know Jesus and rushed to the altar with tears in their eyes, worshiping the living God. You all want that so bad, don't you? I'm not the only freak in this room. I know you all want that. And the question is, is will you do what it takes for God to go, fine, remember? Keep knocking and I'll answer. 
And one day, he's finally going to open the door if you keep knocking, but we're not knocking. Remember Horton, here's a who? I'm just getting this one. You, you, right? this, is, this is the Holy Spirit. You, Horton, here's a who? God, open up the doors. Can't hear you. God, open up the doors. God, open up the doors! And you got to scream and scream and scream, and maybe we're close. But there was just one, they needed one more decibel, remember? One more, one more. Maybe we're that close. And maybe he's just waiting for you to be finally devoted to his purposes, to Jesus Christ and his mission to build the church when he finally opens up the windows of heaven and pours out a blessing and wham, here they come. Y'all want it. And listen, I'm not the only crazy preacher who's going to preach this weekend and wants to see that. They all want to see it. I want to see it. Everyone who's got a real Christian church wants to see that. But the point is, is what congregation is going to do this to get it? It's not up to the preacher. His job, my job, is to equip you to do that work, to come in and pray, to open up your homes, and to be committed to fellowship and prayer and breaking and bread and worship and studying the Word of God. And if you'll do that, he will add to your church each day. Do you want it? Do you want it? I want it. I want to see God add to revolution daily, each day, those that are being saved. That's what I want. And that's why we're opening up these environments every single day, it seems. We're trying to come up with more and more Bible studies on the Apostles' Word, right? So we gather on Wednesday night. Be here. Not just for your own growth and to help everyone else, but because if you'll do that, he'll do that. He'll grow his church. He can't grow it on weak bricks. He needs strong bricks. The foundation has to be strong. You're the foundation. You're the pioneers. You're the ones who chose to be here right now. They're not here yet. You're the bricks. So we have Bible study on Wednesday night, and then we do it again on Sunday night. Then we have prayer on, on Monday nights and we have this on Saturday and we have a, another service on Sunday and then rev groups man fill in the gaps there's a couple days still there right holy devoted followers of Jesus don't just come on Saturday night and in America they don't just come on Sunday these guys in the Bible these men and women they were devoted followers of Jesus and they did it every single day, day after day, continually, ardently, passionately, committed, loyal to this thing. They didn't start a rev group and quit it six months down the road when it became inconvenient. They kept doing it. And every day, the Lord added to the number those that were being saved. Daily opportunities for you and I to each day to display devotion to Jesus so he can bless each day so it's time it's time once and for all to make a decision of what's your choice what's your thing what's your thing not the person next to you not even your spouse what's your thing I don't know if your thing is Jesus Christ in his church I don't know if it's the Gators, if it's Clemson or the Alabama Roll Tide guys, or if it's the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, or I don't know, Tom Brady, your wife, your kids, your company, Casey. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Everybody's got a thing, right? Maybe Bob's thing is Susan. It's nice. Tori's thing could definitely be Maverick, right? That's a brand new baby. Maybe it's Maverick. He's cute. Maybe my thing is Meredith. I don't know what your thing is. But I think it's due time that everybody in this room that God has ordained to be here tonight makes a decision on what their thing is. We need to decide as a family what Revolution Church is going to be known for. What are we? Are we just another church on the block that gathers on the weekend? 
Oh, we be known as devoted followers of Jesus. Not according to somebody else's standard, but according to the standard you just heard in Scripture. You know, I always ask for honesty, and I'm brutal. Maybe that's why the seats aren't so full, but I ask, and you love me for it, and I love you for being here. So don't be ashamed to not raise your hand right now. But how many people in this room right now would love to see God fill this church ten times over with people who don't yet know Him? Okay, so it's universal. Well, there's a way to have, have that happen. You have to make a choice what it's going to be. I've been doing this now at this church for eight years and I'm ready for progress. I'm not satisfied with what I'm seeing. I love you all, but you know what I mean by that? I'm not satisfied with, I don't want to, I won't be satisfied seeing green. Most guys like to see green. I don't care. I don't want to see green. Green means empty. And I believe that God has called me to ministry Moses to lead a people up the mountain of the Lord and to worship him that's what I believe I've always believed that but I've never really said it out loud publicly but I believe that that's what he wants of me and that's what I believe he wants for you because that's why he called you here and so I don't know if you've made a decision of what your thing is but I want to give you a chance right now to do something that's uncomfortable but I think it's powerful and I think it's very profitable for you Jesus said if you will confess me before men I will confess you before my father and so I'm opening up this altar right here right now and if you listen Jesus says that you shouldn't make a vow like you don't like vows you consider the cost before you make any commitment to him because he doesn't like it when people don't keep his word take a few minutes and this thing's just going to keep playing and if you make a decision that you're not fully devoted but you want to be and you just want to make a public declaration to him and to the rest of your church family that Jesus and his church his mission that's your thing now but you need help you need him to help you with that because that's not easy is it if you want to make that public confession right now, this is my thing. I want you to just come right here. And if you can, you can bow before him. I'll step aside so no one ever, ever thinks they're bowing before me. And you can come before the Lord and we'll turn these spots down so no one has to really look at you. But you can come forward and you can bow before the great king and confess your allegiance to him and your devotion to to him and his church and his mission to see his kingdom come in this place. So I'm going to ask you to come. tugging on your heart to get up out of your seat. If you hear his voice, the scripture says, don't harden your heart. You can do what someone else is doing. They're bowing where they are. That's okay too. You're bowing before the Lord. You're committing yourself to him and his mission. another moment 
I plead with you, don't quench the Holy Spirit. If he's tugging on you to move, it's profitable to obey him. You'll never regret obeying the Holy Spirit. Never. Awesome. Please never get up out of pressure, but only if it's pressure from the divine. for you. Anybody else? Father, we understand that coming forward doesn't solve the problem. It just starts the process. Lord, it is you in our weakness that shows strength. It is you, according to your word, it is you that gives us the will and the desire to do what pleases you. So, Lord, we have come forward tonight to declare to you and others that you are now our thing. You are our number one priority. You are the one that we freely and aggressively give ourselves over to. You are the thing that we ardently, passionately, zealously commit to. We are loyal to you and to your church, to your mission to build your kingdom in this place. And to the ends of the earth. That's what you've called us to be, Lord. But we, we have an adversary, Lord, and you know him well. And he will do everything that he can to distract us from this mission. And everything that he can to make us second guess the decision that we've made tonight. Would you burn this decision in our heart? And would you come and fight for us in those moments of weakness when we are feeling down and defeated and don't feel like opening our home, don't feel like studying your word, don't feel like coming to prayer night. All those things, Lord, that the enemy would say, it's okay, one night's okay. Just one bite. But it's not okay, Lord. Help us to be superhuman. Your spirit fills us. The spirit that raised Christ from the dead. Help us to be superhuman in that. To be able to resist the temptations of the enemy and to say yes to you. Fight for us, Lord. And give us the strength to keep this commitment another day. In Jesus' name.